Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us on our webinar. And uh, we're getting the full experience here at Kadiska. Just to make sure we have full knowledge of what working from home is like. I've traveled across the ocean to be at Boris at his home. And uh, so thanks for joining us. Today we'll be looking at all the problems that face IT in a challenging world that's developing with remote workers, work from home, and basically workers anywhere and uh, accessing SaaS and applications and the business systems they need to be productive. So I'm, I'm Scott Sumner, I'm here with Boris. And yes, he's... <laughs> great to see you here, Scott. Yeah. And uh, as you see, it's all, it's all about the remote experience. Huh? It certainly is a remote experience for me, but uh, it's been a pleasure. So let's take a look at uh, how we can help you learn a bit more about what's happening in the world from work from home. So we've all read in the media, quite often during the pandemic, exactly how work from home is something we all appreciate. A lot of us believe it's more productive. And as workers, especially in the information technology sector, if you survey them overwhelmingly, eight out of 10 will say that working in a hybrid model or work from home is actually optimal for productivity. And I guess we found that, right? Because a lot of the time, uh, Kadiska is built on a virtual virtual platform where we all meet together occasionally, but we're all working in our own space. Um, and we'll look at reasons why that's so much more productive in a few minutes. And uh, the companies that are trying to retain talent though, have had to rethink their strategy a number of times. And especially the very high growth companies, uh, the ones that are more in tune with uh, productivity of their employees have embraced what you would call a productivity anywhere model. And uh, this is a very, very strong component of IT, IT operations, network operations really has to respond to this, make sure they gain control over this uh, different perimeter of the employees. And good news for all of us who actually like working from home and realize that it is productive is that it's certainly not disappearing with the pandemic. Uh, if you look at the chart on the right, it's saying here that for new jobs that are posted in, um, in the professional space, um, there's an increase, a dramatic increase of jobs that are offered full-time remote uh, as the only way that they're posted when they post the, the job on their sites. And what this means is that now up to a quarter of the positions that you can apply for are permanently remote. And this, you can see, is actually the curve doesn't follow the pandemic curve at all. It's just increasing and accelerating. And because of this, IT becomes a very strategic business partner for, for the enterprises where IT holds the key is essentially to creating a competitive productivity advantage for their company as they move into this uh, new world. Let's just take a look at the implications. Um, a lot of us thought that work from home, uh, you know, was, wasn't such a bad transition. And the reason for that is the timing coincided dramatically with the availability of completely different infrastructure today. One of them is unified and digital communication collaboration tools uh, like we're using now but also the shift to software as a service applications, uh, platform as a service, it really meant that you could avoid uh, accessing this infrastructure directly through VPNs and private lines and having to go to work to access them. And at the same time, the security methods we're using today, the CASB, Zero Trust Networks, um, are allowing the, the security perimeter to be more boundaryless and follow the employee home. And in addition, if you have a SaaS application, if you're using an office suite, you can use these online now. So you're really not restricted to using uh, out of the box shrink wrapped applications. And that means you could use uh, any device like a Chromebook to do your job. And you can see here in terms of some examples, the one for contact center as a service is an example of an industry that's been completely transformed in a cost basis by people who are maybe just contractors, but they're working from anywhere they are with just simply a Chromebook and that does change the way IT has the ability to monitor what's happening. And, and Boris will take us through some details there. We also seen some very innovative uh, new services coming out like cashier as a service where you have someone in a totally different country serving you on a video screen at the checkout. Uh, keeps the, to some degree a personal touch, but the, it means you can get uh, employees where maybe they're scarce to get. And also we've seen how delivery and logistics has been transformed by, uh, you know, as a service type uh, applications on the cloud. 
Um, so exactly how important is it for, for the audience here today to really appreciate how much responsibility and, and control they have over their company's productivity and retention? Um, it's very easy for an employee to find an experience disappointing. And in fact, basically half of the employees that are out there working remotely will actually leave their job in the next year if they can't be productive at home. If the technology they're using provided by the company doesn't work, and this includes their own home Wi-Fi and things that are outside of the control of IT, but at the same time, as part of their experience. Their expectations are increasing to the point where almost half of people are working from home say that waiting three seconds for an application like Salesforce or Gmail to load is basically an outage, uh, which is why the cat is getting a lot of attention and a lot of petting because you're frustrated and also you can't work. Uh, why is that critical? Because as much as people like working from home, they know they're being judged in terms of, of productivity and measured by that. And they want to deliver at least as effective as they were in the office. So that's really where the, the tension comes in. Uh, I mean, there are all several kinds of challenges when it comes to uh, allowing people to work from uh, remote places, work from home, work from, tra uh, from their travel places, you know, hotels, etc. cetera. Uh, there are uh, multiple challenges. I mean, I guess the first thing is that the connectivity between the users and the app is, is radically different. Uh, when you think about it, whether you have a kind of an old fashioned way to secure your connectivity to your data center or your SaaS platforms, or whether you use, you know, modern uh, zero trust network uh, type capabilities or CASBs or secured web gateways. I mean, the first thing is you go through public networks. Uh, your users are basically connected to the internet through an ISP. That ISP gives them a certain route to connect to either the CASB or your VPN gateway, uh, your to reach either your data center or your cloud. Uh, and sometimes from your data center, they will reach a, a SaaS platform through that. Um, there are plenty of ways that can go wrong. I mean, basically every router on the way can be uh, a source of latency or a source of loss. Uh, and on top of that, I mean, the route may change. Uh, this is as simple as this. I mean, you might have a short route or a long route, uh, and basically you have no control on that, and by default you've got no visibility on that. So basically zero trust network performance is, is hard to grasp if you don't have... It's a funny term, a zero trust. It. A lot of people don't trust their network. Yeah. I don't think that's what they mean, but uh, ultimately, not. I you know, know I did a survey just for fun. I took uh, seven of our customers and I measured the user experience to uh, Google Office Suite. Uh -huh. And you look at the impact by contribution of network and device and so on. And it was 73% of the impact on user experience came from the network side. Very different causes every time, but... Uh, it is one of the most important areas to focus on, of course. It, it is definitely critical. And, and, and network is not a single, it's not one thing. It, it's a variety of different factors and components uh, that add up to, to make a certain network performance. And uh, we'll look into that in, in more details later. Um, the second part is really about the experience. So the overall end-to-end -end experience that a user has when he connects to uh, a certain applications. And of course, uh, connectivity has an impact, but it's not the single driver for that. Mm. Uh, CASBs uh, have an impact on that. The kind of application you connect to have an impact on that. Where they redirect you, if they've got a global presence and basically have nodes all over the place and how far or close you stand to those nodes uh, also make a difference. And the application response itself, of course, uh, has its impact you know, on, on the user experience. What are all these little blue... Uh... Things that, I mean, I'm, if you're connecting to Slack, isn't it just an IP address? No, not really. I mean, if you think of SaaS, uh, you, you should think about it as uh, in a very different way than a traditional application. You know, a traditional application, you would look at uh, one user connecting to one place for a single pass. Uh, SaaS application is definitely not designed that way. Um, they, they leverage multiple kinds of infrastructure, you know, CDN. Clouds, mm -hmm. different clouds. Uh, they usually incorporate, uh, you know, some third parties for authentication for a lot of things um, to to basically provide the right data to their users. Uh, but they are extremely distributed by default, so and each yeah. of those components that are distributed have their own behavior. Some of them are, some of them, you, as we're showing here, are third party, right? So, how, can you give an example of you're trying to connect to Salesforce and then well, something else may be actually the problem? 
Yeah, maybe, maybe you, you authenticate into Salesforce through your Google account. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's one. Uh, maybe uh, Salesforce has got forms and they don't distribute forms and, and they use a form service for that. Maybe yeah, uh, yeah. they have images and they host that into a CDN of uh, uh, a Cloudflare or an Akamai or whoever that is. Uh, there are plenty of options and maybe mm -hmm. your Salesforce incorporate data from another SaaS platform and actually I'm it sure gets that data know, from API. Yeah. From the last uh, webinar so, we found everyone's got at least 10 other platforms connecting to their SaaS applications. I think when you talk about the cloud, there's there's also the cloud of <laughs> visibility that we're seeing. It's a little cloudy out there. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, there's all these new things happening. It, it's not as simple as you would say, it's not as simple as you thought it was, but what are the challenges that happen here because of uh, uh, this new infrastructure? Well, I mean, there are plenty of challenges. The first one is you don't know what you, what you don't measure. And basically everything you've built is, uh, isn't built for mm. uh, that new model. So basically most companies have invested in monitoring tools, they've invested in performance management tools, uh, but those, those tools were designed for, you know, traditional way. Yeah, it didn't look working. like this uh, so, five years ago. No. I mean, the, the, that old picture, you know, of the MPLS network and uh, uh, the VPN and the data centers and so on isn't even shown on that picture. No. Because no, the work from home uh, stuff simply relies on different kind of infrastructure. So you've got a different way to host the applications. It's SaaS, it's cloud-based applications. It's a different kind of networks with public networks and series of operators, not just one. Uh, some that you are customers of and some that you don't even know uh, that are in the middle. And then you've Absolutely. got some extension of that, which are SD1 uh, gateways and CASBs, mm -hmm. uh, which are which have a network component to it on top of their security capabilities. Well, that's it. There's security on every, even the direct connect you show here, yep. bypassing some of the this for uh, specific sites that can be configured, but it means you're going through a TLS 1.3. Yeah, encrypted. You know, yeah, it's encrypted. Your NPM traditional network traffic analysis solution doesn't see much of that, doesn't understand the experience from the users using yeah. that network connectivity. So basically your old stuff is kind of incapable of uh, giving mm -hmm. visibility on that old platform. Well, it's good for looking at the old stuff, right? You need to yeah. keep that going. But in this case, I mean, you look at Kadiska as a modern company, we don't use a VPN. No. Right, we don't use any private lines and uh, we do have cloud services, right? That's what we host our platform on. So we'll show you that. But uh, yeah, so let's look at yeah, what it uh, means to be uh, using your old tooling. What happens when you try to use that? Well, it's quite simple. If you think of the application side, uh, you'd think of synthetic testing, you'd think of application performance management, you know, yeah. things like App Dynamics and Euralic and so on. The thing is, I mean, those things don't work on SaaS, uh, they don't really work, you know, on you outsourced it in oh, the cloud yeah, that easily that are super distributed. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then you would look at your old solution for traffic analysis and you think, okay, encryption. Uh, encryption reduces the scope of visibility from those solutions to the transport layer at best. And maybe yeah, sometimes yeah, not even profiling. recognizing what applications we're talking about, but definitely not showing the experience part or isolating where the, uh, why the experience got degraded. And finally, you know, those zero trust network, there's, there's another question which we don't know which pass is used. So we don't even know where to tap the traffic. We don't even know uh, what is going to be the pass. So basically making sense of latency measurement without knowing the pass that is used or what's the destination for a given yeah. cloud service uh, doesn't take you to any actionable conclusion. It's, it's, if, you're, if you're an IT and this is your job, I have to say that the thing we hear the most is, I don't actually know which domain or layer the problem is originating from. Is it the network, the server, oh. the device, the user's IP? Is there Wi-Fi? But actually, that's something that's you can't do anything until you really can see that level of clarity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a yeah. So you need a totally different kind of approach. Yeah, and you need something that really matches the the new realities. I mean, overlays and underlays. You make it. You yeah. know, you you make a VPN connection to. Uh, someplace, or you build a tunnel to your CASB provider, uh, that's one hope when you measure it from the other lane. <laughs> uh, but basically, the length or the duration or the latency of that hope completely varies depending on what's the, the actual way your packets are taken to build yes, that tunnel. It's a PPP so, problem. Yep. Um, but 
also, you know, you, in the past, I guess you could instrument, uh, put some agent on the computer. Uh, but we just talked about how Chromebooks and bring your own device are changing the game. And most of you probably, uh, you have one more email to send late at night. I'm sure you don't take out your, your work computer. You might just use uh, your Chromebook or another laptop log in remotely and then do that. But that problem is still IT's problem, right? Yeah, and, and agents in general, I mean, there are so many agents already uh, in place that most customers don't want additional agents because the, you know, the workstations themselves can't, manage, can't really yeah. cope with more agents and more consumption. Wow. So, yeah. you know, all, all, all those solutions are uh, not as acceptable as you'd think and basically end up not being deployed. So that, that's the whole gap, that's the know, gap. In, the, in the tooling. It's not convenient that we need this right now, right? Uh, but Definitely actually, not. so you don't want your home users doing their own IT because uh, they can't always call their grandfather to come and fix it. <laughs> so no, there's got to uh, be a better way and, and And basically the help desk guy who is going to receive that yeah. call cannot do much either. Yeah. So that, that's the, the current situation. So w when we think about what's going to make, you know, the overall remote worker digital experience. Uh, if we try to divide, you know, those uh, this end-to-end -end experience into uh, different drivers, different components, uh, we've got to think that way. So at the top, you've got the user level, and then the VPN or the CASBs, uh, which sit in the middle, and then all, all of this is already hosted and connected to through public networks, and then you've got the different. Uh, host names that are going to try to connect to to make their SaaS or internal applications work. Basically. This is crazy, right? When you think of these two users on the screen, they could be in different continents like we usually are. Of course. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see. When we look at this live with, with some data of uh, common applications that you use, it would be interesting to see where the path is from where you live. That's something we want to show uh, a little later on in the webinar. Definitely. And, and you know, I mean, few people, we, we, I mean, from a certain size of companies are actually uh, only spread in one region, one country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're spread uh, all over the world in most cases. Uh, so that that's the reason. I mean, I guess then the, the first driver we have to pay attention to is the overall latency between users and, and clouds. And as you mentioned, that can vary uh, drastically uh, depending on the region, depending on... Time of um, day. Yeah, well, and, and, and and also depending on the application structure. So how spread the whole things of the applications you're trying to connect to are uh, at a global scale. It's not obvious where they are either no, because I mean, they move around too, depending yes. on the load balancing. And how many times, I mean, if each one of us has done this, you're on your internet connection at home, the latency is increasing you, you're starting to lose your call. So you switch to your cell phone as a tethering hotspot and somehow it works better until it doesn't, right? It, it's this kind of thing. It's very it, dynamic. It changes it, all the time. It varies, and and yeah. the, the SaaS application and each host name might change their DNS resolution through the day, throughout the day. So at some point you might be connected very locally, and at some point you might cross the Atlantic to connect to one application. Wow, my my Gmail is still connecting to North America, so it's yeah certainly and, a long wait. <laughs> yeah, and we'll take a look at all the SaaS applications we've used, and you'll see a difference. Uh, second driver is everything we put in the middle to secure uh, that connectivity. So VPNs, uh, SASE, CASBs, they all have their own behavior, and they had some processing on the way. So a VPN has a layer; it has a, a, a you know some form of processing to actually. Encrypt the traf traffic and secure it. Yeah, there's authentication coming and from third parties. The Casbys are not magic. I mean, they <laughs> either you know work as a proxy and had some processing on top of the connectivity of the latency, or they work as you know a pass through uh, mm -hmm. gateway, and yeah. they also had some processing for that. Well, then again, they could go straight into an SD WAN that has additional processing. Right? Absolutely, so it's the magic of the universal CPE. So that's <laughs> another driver that has a huge impact. And uh, finally, there's a question on, you know, what, what, what is going to be the pass between those gateways and the actual application, mm -hmm. or not the application, but the whole set of components of those applications. Uh, and that, that is also important. Uh, when we look further, I mean, obviously, uh, a lot of those applications are rendered by browsers. Uh, the the mm. one thing which uh, you have to know is that browsers basically do not aren't magic either. Mm. Um, so they receive Pretty data. Simple, simple uh, animals, yeah. They have limited uh, as far as the number of 
pieces of data they can receive at once. They've got yeah. their yeah. limitations as to how much throughput they can accept. Uh, they have limits. Uh, there's a, they have a work to do and basically some processing to do to be able to show the data to a user. That takes time. That's another driver. What about the people who keep 58 uh, Chrome tabs open while they're working? Doesn't that affect the page performance? Well, of course it does. Yeah. I mean, it does at the All network the level, it does at the system level, mm -hmm. uh, it does at the browser level, obviously. Okay, so I know a few people I need to talk to about that. Yeah, good, good. Good thing to do. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, you're receiving data. Uh, there's no magic in the data transfer takes time. Uh, so that depends on, you know, the throughput that you have on your uh, line. It, does also oh, depend on now. the overall, you know, quality of the uh, the end-to-end -end circuit through the internet, uh, and how much data you need. Also, uh, though, it's which a is kind right? of a, yeah. a silly one, but it's a silly but, one, but, yeah, but it's thinking, a big driver. Uh, this, this is the final one, right? That actually interacts with that all the time. Correct. And the last one is kind of obvious. Every time you make a request to a server, there's a processing happening at the server, and it takes time for them to stop yeah. responding and transferring data. So that's also another driver which matters. So all of that is basically the whole set of drivers you need to have an eye on uh, to make sure that your remote users get the quality uh, uh, you know, of service they need to, to deliver their work and, and work fine. So then if you, I guess so that's, that's what we want to do, though, is just summarize what actually most of you at home would recognize, knowing the challenges, knowing the drivers of poor performance, there are some that really stand out as the ones that you need to keep an eye on. Correct. I mean, that, that, that can be useful as, I mean, for help desk rep that would have to fix, you know, uh, one, one of his collaborators, one of his users' problems as to, you know, getting an overview of what is the overall IT productivity for the yeah, whole yeah. workforce of your company. I mean, if you take it to the detail or if you look at it, you know, from a global perspective as to where can I find ways to optimize my worker, my remote worker experience and productivity, yeah. uh, there are sort of uh, six components. Yeah, this would be the checklist, I guess, of what you need to look at just to see where you stand, right, in terms of... Exactly, that. and yeah. you should keep an eye on all of that for all of your users. I guess the first one, and it's a very specific one to the, the cloud world and the SaaS world is redirections. Mm -hmm. um, that's true at the CASB level, that's true at the SaaS level. Uh, sometimes when you connect to Teams, uh, for example, if you were a Microsoft user traveling in Europe, normally based in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, when you connect to Teams in Europe, I mean, there's a good chance you still connect to US nodes or Canadian nodes, and that is going to create a huge issue. If you Use a Caspi, for mm -hmm. example, there's a good chance that um, either for load balancing reasons or because they uh, misinterpret their, your, your geographic location, yeah. they do not redirect you to a closed node, but to a very far node. And basically all your traffic yeah. is going around the world uh, to reach your SaaS. <laughs> Just and like you of traveling course, more. That is going to have a huge impact. So yeah. That's number one. Number two, I mean, of course, your local ISP and your own Wi-Fi uh, will have an impact on on how good your experience is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of, uh, you know... A, this is a, a tough one no because the company doesn't choose that. No, but, uh, you know, if you have, you know, a thousand workers uh, working in a certain region and you realize that one ISP is definitely worse than yeah, the others, yeah. so it's actually... uh, well, maybe there's something you can do because uh, if you look at the cost, you know, of poor uh, experience, you know, yeah, getting the to the application from a really productivity yeah. standpoint, uh, maybe switch, having them switch to the right operator yeah. to, for your own set of, of applications can kind of have For, for business critical, I can see yeah. making a package with a certain ISP that all the employees can take advantage of. Yeah. The same Wi-Fi router or something that they it, can manage, right? It, it would absolutely make sense. That's, yeah, since you think if there's more than half people working at home. Yep. It's not, I don't think it's the biggest issue, uh, but I think it's a pretty important one. It's outside it, it the visibility. Be. Yeah, It can be, definitely. Yeah. Um, Casbys and cloud proxy delays. I mean, uh, the fun part is that we see a lot of uh, geographic redirection issues around Casbys. Yeah. Um, that the the, the 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 latency between the user and Casby is highly variable. Some people get super short. Well, it can be in the seconds, people. though, right? They've seen it. Uh, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, that they can go very wrong. You know, I remember one customer that had his staff in India. Some were connecting to the Indian node for in 300 milliseconds, which is already huge. Already Some people huge. were redirected to the West Coast from another <laughs> operator, and that was 
I mean, tremendously impacting. Yeah, uh, it's very creative. I mean, these are things you can actually fix with the right information. They're not, they're not outside your control. And, you know, not all CASBs are equal depending on the region you want to cover. Mm -hmm. That's one. Not all CASBs have the same processing time when they proxy your traffic, mm -hmm. for example. So, and I'm very surprised to see very few customers actually taking measurement of that when they... Uh, when they do test on the future CASB provider. I'm thinking um, they probably think like an SD-WAN that the CASB provides a certain level of, of statistics. Well, it's sold to be impactless. Ah. Uh, it is sold to have global coverage, mm. uh, but you know, no, the global coverage of one isn't the same as the global coverage of the second one. So um, It probably works better in the trials when you just have one region testing it out, then you go probably. global. We've seen some pretty accidental problems, but that's fun to look at in a minute. We'll look at some live data there. Yeah, for sure. And then a lot of the remote worker application traffic actually goes through the internet. And the internet is dynamic by default. So that means that um, one way to reach a certain point at a given time is going to be different, uh, maybe 30 minutes or a day after. Uh, and of course, I mean, there are incidents uh, at operators that belong to the overall internet infrastructure. So you've got to keep track of that also. Finally, I mean, obvious, uh, the application components. So every component basically has a certain response time, yeah. a certain pattern, can um, be degraded. Some of them are waiting for other components to load, and uh, if you're using a single-page yeah. app, you might be there for a while. It's, uh, queries are running. Yeah, and number six, I mean, your browser has, a, I mean, as you said, if you've got 50 tabs or 30 <laughs> in Chrome, it there's happens. a good chance uh, it's going to take a little longer to render the data uh, than if you've got a proper browser. Uh, some applications also work better or worse with different browsers. Yes, absolutely, and you also so, see often that... Uh, well, you can change browsers yourself to try different applications. Yep. Uh, but certainly there's some, you see an update about three or four times a week now in Chrome. So if you're Absolutely. a little bit out of date, there's something happening that they're trying to fix. So it's never really a stable platform. Uh, absolutely. And I think you, you, you had it one. I think, you know, all of that is very digital and so on. But the, the physical layer also has some impact. So anything that can oh, basically yeah. sit between uh, you as a user and a computer uh, can uh, have in, that's uh, the ultimate physical the productivity. There's so, a lot of productivity. We, you know, some things you can't control. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, and this what the last one is ultimately a problem that many of us face. But it's also you know part of the solution. If you can't load a page in less than three well, seconds, you must well do something useful. Yeah, exactly. Make a make a cat hat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, when it comes to finding ways to optimize the the remote worker productivity, what's the right uh, what's the right way around that? Uh, I guess the first thing is to get an overview. It's to monitor the employee experience. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you got, uh, you know, executive requests from, uh, from, from your uh, directors to get a view of <clears throat> what is uh, the ability of, uh, IT, uh, of IT users to work from home. Yeah, who are they? What, are, what are they mean, using? We yeah. had a lot, a lot of that, you know, in the, uh, at the start of the pandemic because... Uh, I guess, you know, executive wondered, are they actually able yeah. are they actually working? <laughs> to, 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 to get work done? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the first thing. The second thing is, if anything goes wrong, detect it. Uh, and detect it in real time as much as possible yeah. uh, to know exactly which users, where they are, what applications they're connecting to. We're uh, talking and, some pretty basic essentials here. First yeah. of all, have visibility. Yeah. Detect problems. This is pretty serious if you don't have it. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have it, you basically it. rely on your users to yeah. be so frustrated mm -hmm. that they take the action of calling your help desk. Yeah, yeah. And probably you, um, you, you, you uh, also um, make sure that many of your users call the help desk to start. Well, that's a good way to doing kind of know. But I think something we, about it. We learned that one in a hundred users will call when there's a problem. The other ninety-nine will either suffer in silence or pet the cat. Or leave in the or area. actually look for a new job while they're waiting. Yeah, yep. that happens. A third of people last year left their job because of technology issues. Once you know you've got a problem, I mean, the question is to know where the problem comes from. So, uh, you know, which which infrastructure layer is responsible for that? Do I have an application problem? Do I have a Casby problem? Do I have Wi-Fi? Do I have a, an ISP problem? Do I have a, a browser problem that, that happens to? So basically it's about who owns the problem. Yeah, and, and know where to find the solution. 
So, I mean, if this problem belonged to your SaaS provider, well, at least you know it's not your problem. You have to talk to them. You have to talk to them. Well, and you need something to tell them it's it's coming Precisely. from them. Yeah, you need to speak uh, their language. Yeah. Yeah. So you you need data basically. Yeah. And from there, you need to have your teams or your providers to drill down and actually look at what is the origin of the problem. So what, what's the root cause? Uh, and then take action. But basically taking action without visibility. Uh, doesn't take you very far mm. simply because you don't know if you fix the problem. No, so many uh, so many things look like causes, but they're just coincident. They happen at the same time, or there's three or four things, right? A lot of intermittent problems, and so the ultimate root cause might be a combination of context, device, and application, or it might be something serious. Absolutely. So yeah, I think the hard part here is also prioritizing. The people who call for a certain kind of issue might not be the ones that are affected the most. So how do you prioritize the limited time that you have? That's correct. So if we get back to the challenges, you know, from an, from a connectivity standpoint, how can we help? Uh, how can we basically address those challenges? If you remember the connectivity challenge, I mean, it's quite simple. You've got your user, it goes through VPN, uh, ends up in the SaaS through data center or not, uh, or basically has a, a cloud proxy in the middle a Casby solution. Hmm. Uh, basically, it's quite simple. I mean, from a connectivity standpoint, um, Casby has deployed hundreds of uh, um, managed stations that are going to test the connectivity to know exactly what's going to be the route you take and how efficient that route is uh, to connect to both your VPN, SaaS E, and SaaS uh, platforms. And basically, the idea is to uh, get a view of, you know, what is the quality of the connectivity for all of your users worldwide to connect to your SaaS, private applications um, direct or through uh, CASBase. So you're seeing, let's say a region, one region has an ISP issue, you can detect uh, if that's affecting your Salesforce or yep. your Office 365, yeah, from any region that you're doing business. Yeah, in. and in the same way, which applications is, is currently available from where, or say that I'm, tr I'm thinking, you know, of implementing a CASB. I'm yeah. actually shortlisting three vendors. Um, that gives me, uh, you know, an objective way to choose which one is actually fit for my user locations. Oh, of course, you don't have to deploy these. They're already there. No. Yeah. So no, you just have to a, them up. It's a minute yeah. deployment. Oh, we'll, play, we'll play with those in a minute, yeah. All right. And then uh, there's the user experience. So really uh, how long the user has to wait to see his data. Uh, coming from the internal applications and the SaaS applications and the cloud-based application through that infrastructure. And for that, basically, the instrumentation uh, is going to be as simple as, it, uh, as deploying an extension in their browsers. Basically, it's something that collects data that is already computed, processed by the browser, so it doesn't have any RAM or CPU consumption. Uh, and basically, uh, tells you how long your users have to wait and if they have to wait for too long, what mm -hmm. what, what is uh, what is the, uh, the the infrastructure layer which is responsible for that and for which transactions and when? So you really want these two uh, technologies put together? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes sense because it gives you an end-to-end -end view of the whole thing. I mean, if you have only Watcher, you are going to know exactly doing what, connecting to which applications, from where, connecting direct through the Casbys or. Uh, yeah, yeah. And basically, for doing what transactions to get slow response and what's the infrastructure like. So if you know it's Once a network you know, issue, yeah, yeah, then you can do you something. Know. Or it's not a network issue, you well, can do something else. I would right? say it's a redirection or a network issue. You know it's this, but you don't know where it's happening you need to go and which vendor uh, would be responsible for fixing it. So that, that's what the managed station is going to bring uh, to the equation. Okay, wow, so it's really the, the combination of experience monitoring and connectivity management. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. So we'll take a look. Yeah. Okay. Probably the best we can do is definitely uh, connect your live platform and uh, and check it out. So I'm just going to change the. So this will be fun because we're working from home. Yeah. Uh, Let's monitoring see. Monitoring the work from home performance. So if you use any of the applications we use uh, at Kadiska. It'll be interesting to see how these applications perform from different parts of the world. But also, every day is different. There's always something changing. And I think what's important is to look at the live data. So what we're looking at here, Boris, this is happening now. 
It is live data. So this is really, you know, what's happening for our team. So you see, we've got our whole set of, of data, basically. Uh, you see, we've got basically our own applications, so, so the Kaliska platform, which is cloud hosted, and then third party applications, SaaS applications. You have, of course, you see Bright Talk, uh, you see the Google Suite that we use, you see HubSpot, which is our CRM, uh, and other things around. There are two pages of applications. <laughs> and for each of those, you see how many users are connected to it today, uh, how long people spend on it, you know, on average, uh, how far. Uh, from a connectivity standpoint, they are, and you see that, for example, Bright Talk isn't doing a great job. From we're, uh, we're pretty far. I mean, it's not. It's yeah. funny when you think about it, but because it's a linear video, we're probably doing okay. But if um, this was a this was a Zoom call, you'd be in serious trouble. Yeah, 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 probably. Uh, and then you see for traditional web applications how long it takes to load a page if the page is the right, you know, uh, indicator of experience. Uh, and if you've got a single page application, so a page where basically all the interactions do not require changing page. I mean, Bright Talk is an example. Gmail would be an example. Now what's an example that isn't a single page application? Or just an old fashioned website that your parents yeah, built or something? Yeah, an e commerce site in some it's cases. It's getting pretty close uh, to everything. Is yeah, uh, if you still maintain a very old fashioned yeah. uh, Salesforce version, for example, you might have that. But even something like YouTube is a single page application. Oh, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. so really transactions are the only way to understand it. When you think about page load performance, if you load YouTube once a day or Spotify yeah. in the background once a day, the page load happens once, right? And, and the breakdown you see here already give you an indication of, you know, mm. what, what infrastructure layer is responsible for. for I the thought problem. Google Drive was a problem, but that's just yeah, a no, data that's transfer. Data. That kind it's of makes just sense. data transfer. Yeah, you transfer a lot of data. So do you through. think see anything funny happening here so far, or does it look pretty normal to you? Well, uh, I would say that, you know, so, some of those applications, for example, stand very far apart. So take the example of Bright Talk, doesn't stand close to the users on, on our team. Uh, if I look at page two, what am I going to see? Yeah, page two is probably an interesting one. Yeah. So Asana, Asana uh, our task management tool, looks pretty bad, but pretty bad because it has a lot of waiting. So it means that there is a lot of uh, queuing uh, happening in the browser. Mm. So the browser cannot process all the requests at the time. It's got to do some, put some in queue, take some, put others in queue. Uh, and that represents Ooh, most well, of the time waited. That's a lot uh, of time. Yeah. 2.3 seconds. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very bad. So it's a mix of uh, uh, I don't have the right connectivity probably, but mostly my application is in designed in the right way. There's something. So when you're trying to tell your boss you got the job done and you have to wait three seconds for it to register, it might be a bad day. Yeah, no, probably. Oh, I mean, okay. Well, at it, least I can tell you that yeah. I finished the job. He, he tells, yeah. <laughs> he, he tells you also where users are right now. So if we look here, okay, uh, that's where we are, remote people, uh, old people, uh, remote people. Oh, nobody's on site. No that's kidding. normal. We have a yeah. remote workshop, so yeah, that's, uh, th that's why. <laughs> uh, and then you can, you know, drill down and, and really look for the people and see where they are and uh, what what kind, I mean, for, for the people uh, where they are. So, but so you can also change powerful. to you, you look at something uh, like, uh, how fast they load. Yeah. If you're in the United States and you got people in all 50 states, they're going to see a radically different experience. And this way, you can sure. really pinpoint it quickly. Right? It Correct. looks like everything's pretty healthy. Yeah, you probably see want, want to know, you know, who's using which ISP, mm -hmm. uh, sitting on which site. Um, nobody's on site today, as I mentioned. So which ISP are we on? Uh, probably free. I mean, you see most of our team is actually on free. Yeah. You see some people move to their 4G connection because the, the free connection was not good enough. Uh, and they use LDCOM for that. And they actually get a better experience and better connectivity mm -hmm. than people on free, uh, which is yeah. okay. Well, nice. Seems like Bell Canada is having a bit of a latency. Yep. So if we want to dig further into, okay, how the location of the people impact their experience, we can just click here. And we'll see the evolution of the page loads and the API call processing and the errors. And we can relate, you know, uh, basically how uh, the ISP used or the region or the country affects both the connectivity and the processing. Or if people use corporate access, for example, Zscaler, you see how far they stand apart mm -hmm. from the Zscaler node. So 56 
milliseconds and you see the breakdown in the same way for their experience. So you see the network setup is still uh, the having part, a pretty right? uh, big yeah. impact. Okay. So you can see that that way you can also, you know, check in a graphical way and understand, okay, the people remote, what is their latency to the different applications, the people using Zscaler, mm -hmm. which applications are they connected to, and what's the outcome in terms of connectivity. And of course, if you want to filter on any of that, you can filter on Zscaler and you look at the data, it's only people connecting to um, Cadiscap platform. You see when they use the application, how they evolve through time, uh, and you could get to their IP address if they are not authenticated, okay? You can get rid of that filter. And if you want to see, okay, who are the people connected on free? Um, you see that they have a slow transfer. Uh, you can know, okay, they have slow transfer on Google Docs. Uh, you could see where they have good and bad performance on each application. And you could even filter on a given application. So uh, Scott, you're here, for example, you, uh, you had a pretty bad experience from a transfer point of view. Yeah. If I want to know exactly what happened to you, uh, I can see the three ASPs you've been on. Um, I can Ooh. see when you had that bad experience. I can tell you it's on docs. I could uh, spot a specific time where you had a degradation, for example. And uh, we know exactly how this happened. And right? I know, <laughs> okay, it's Google Docs, and that was a transfer time, and I could even get back to, okay, how you loaded a certain page and what page was slow to load. So, for example, this one looks like the pretty bad one, and I could tell you how it got loaded and exactly what was slow to load. So really down, you can get down to the individual, and this is all happening in real time, right? There's no yep. wire shark going yep. on here yep. and uh, yep. waiting yep. for queries. And yep. So that's kind of the amazing thing. You don't have the time uh, to address all these issues if you have to look for evidence from yesterday. Correct. And, uh, and if we wonder, you know, why a certain application, for example, has got bad latency, uh, it's quite simple. I mean, I'm going to take a, a, a common example. I mean, we use Slack to uh, ease collaboration, you know, in our remote work model. Uh, and I can tell you exactly where Slack is good to access or where it's not so good. So in Europe, it looks good. But for example, uh, in the US, you see some part of the US are not properly covered uh, for Slack. And mostly the West Coast. See? And, and the people connecting, for example, from California. This is not because there's more people there. This is because no, of actual just, connectivity. Right? Yeah, it's actual connectivity. So it's a, it's a mix of, you know, the, the setup from uh, Slack and mm. the connectivity happening in the, in the US. Yeah. Uh, so you see, we test that from three locations in, in California. Uh, maybe I'm going to take the, the whole pass. And you see, in San Jose, we see a, a clear degradation here happening. So probably that's the thing we want to understand. It seems a little ironic to me, but why? <laughs> that's a Silicon Valley company. I know, but you know, shit happens everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely, I guess. Okay. So and this time of day too, there's a lot of people working late. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So you see the clear change. You see the red part is the San Jose part. Um, the Los Angeles part is the blue part. You see, mm -hmm. it's not that stable. Uh, and basically, when you're going to look. Uh, we're going to be able to see exactly why this is slow or... Uh, oops. So what we want to do here is we want to take a look at the routes, right, that are running between these two locations. Yep. Uh, to the different... Well, I guess they might not actually go to the same host in the end, right? Correct. Okay, so what what would normally be... Well, you, 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 you see here, path. I mean, yeah. this is Los Angeles, this is your station. Um, on the right, what you see are all the, diff the possible DNS resolutions or the you know, IP uh, that we use connecting from the same place. And San Jose is taking you to also different places like that. Wow. So, so what's happening in the middle there with all these pink dots? Oh, there? that's just a, a cloud network. That's uh, okay, what so a cloud network does. Oh, so it's Amazon it looks like. Network. I mean, it's super yeah. load balanced. Yeah. Uh, so probably, uh, you know, you don't care so much about that. No, you can no. simplify that. You know, if you don't want to see that, you can say, okay. No, but it is and scary that doesn't mean how complex those networks are. Right? Oh, no, they're, 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 not they're a mess. Control. Yeah. <laughs> A mess, so you can simplify that and yeah. you know have just you know one dot instead of all of that. Okay, so who's getting the worst latency right now? Is it uh, if you're going to Slack from those two cities? It was uh, Los Angeles had. A um, very I mean, Los Angeles is fairly stable overall with small changes, you know, every minute. Uh, San Jose was pretty good until 8 a.m. 
uh, and then got bad. Mm. You can see the path from Los Angeles. There seems to be a, yeah, a couple of paths people can take, and it's going back and forth between them. Yeah, we can maybe focus on on one of those to make sure uh, it's actually uh, uh, clear. So I'm going to simplify the thing by looking, you know, at just uh, either Los Angeles or San Jose. So let's do one and the other. So you see those changes that mm. are happening all the time and changing the, the, the latency. Uh, well, it's quite simple. You've got two routes. You've got yeah, one route through uh, Cogent, mm -hmm. and you've got one route through that ISP, uh, which is called Zio, mm -hmm. uh, which takes you in the end to uh, something in Amazon, right? Yeah. And you've got three uh, directions. If you want to know, okay, what is the route to reach that point, you just click here and you see that. Uh, if you want to see the route to that one, just click here and you see exactly what route takes you there. Um, and basically, if you want to know, okay, when everything is pretty good, what is the route that I'm taking? You simply click in the graph and you see exactly where am I taking ah, this case. and what's the, the route which is so, taken. Well, the question we hear all the time uh, is, you know, so what, what, how much of this is in my control if I'm the network operations team? Well, there are multiple things you can do uh, around that. I mean, the first thing is knowing whether you've got a poor redirection, so you're being redirected, for example, very far away. Mm -hmm. So maybe that San Jose is going to be a better example of that. But mm -hmm. uh, say that uh, when you connect to Slack, you're not taken to the US from the US, but you're taken from the US to somewhere else. Mm. Uh, well, you can definitely call Slack or open a ticket if you've yeah. got data and, and show you know what happened. Okay, so San Jose has got a brutal change here. Mm. You move from 20 milliseconds to 40, you're probably not redirected to the same place. Yeah, okay, looking a lot more complex. There. See, and that one is not accessed through Amazon, it's accessed somewhere else. Um, and you can check, okay, when I'm at 20 milliseconds from Slack. Is this something you could change inside? I mean, of course, if, it, if it comes from your ISP, you yeah. can do something. Yeah. If it comes from your CASB, you can do something as well. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, here, I'm taking to Amazon in the US. When things go wrong, um, what is happening? So it's really about understanding uh, which which how the routes are set up. Yeah, correct. Which ones are in your control? Yeah, and here I'm taking to a d totally different place outside Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the reason why that that's what I could tell you know to uh, to to Slack. Yeah. And if we take another example, say Asana, where we saw the connectivity is bad, maybe they simply do not have hosting close to certain it's kind probably of users. Likely, yeah. So if you are a significant size customer. Uh, you can probably complain about that. So let me take up and take a look at, you know. But this is what we were talking about, redirections being so important, right? That you have yeah. an understanding of how I it's mean, happening. Take a look at that. That That is for us now. Uh, it's pretty clear. I mean, if you sit on the west, uh, on the east coast, you get very good performance. Yeah, if you right? sit on the west coast, you're okay. But if you are a global company and you've got people in APAC, they're going to suffer massively from uh, that application. Yeah. And the same for Europe and for Latin America as well. So, I mean, Asana could probably improve things quite a bit, just like a lot of us could improve our own web yeah, apps that we do by putting in a CDN, choosing I mean, carefully they, where to host things. Well, that, and they should have the, the proper cloud architecture for their customers. <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it I guess they don't use a tool like this, Boris. Sounds like a no-brainer. It, it looks pretty clear to me, but... Uh, it looks like our time is wrapping up. There are some questions that have come in. I think what we'll do is we'll reach out to you and we'll make sure that the community here today has access to that. All right. Thanks well, everyone for joining. It was great talking to you guys. Yeah, have a good Bye. time working at home. All right, bye-bye.